So welcome to I just wanted to welcome to the INC job talk series. Um, Tatiana is now going to talk to us about hyperbolic geometry. Thank you, Michael, for the invitation, and thanks to everybody for coming and on um, Zoom too. So um, I'm here to share my uh, what used to be enthusiasm and now became a conviction. Convinced that it, that the mm -hmm. term. Yes. Um, that most things in biology have a hyperbolic geometry. So that's our now no hypothesis <laughs> that things are hyperbolic. And um, I will discuss um, in nature of stimuli, neural responses, and we also have some data from perception, which I will skip. And um, and I would also argue that it, the, the reason it's in nature of stimuli is because it's not only in neural responses, but it's also in genetic networks and in, in other things. So this is the, um, the work on neural responses. It's the work by Hancho Zhang, who is a neuroscience graduate student here, and um, is scheduled to graduate soon. Um, so I will begin with uh, a motivation, but why we are fascinated by hyperbolic geometry. So there are maybe two reasons. One reason is that every time you have a tree-like network or organization in the data, one should think about hyperbolic geometry. And the reason is that if you see a tree like this, um, and you want to evaluate distances between them, uh, between two points here, um, maybe if I point with the pointer, then people are through the thing. We're getting an, an example of their <laughs> sort of college, fractal cauliflower. Yes, exactly. Um, any cauliflower, I think as a regular cauliflower, is, um, yeah. this is not, I think this is not a regular cauliflower. But I would argue that maybe a regular cauliflower is an even better example. This one is an example of hyperbolic geometry here. And uh, because it's like a spiral grows and so on. It's a seashell, I think. You think it's a seashell? Um, Krista, what is that? It's some sort of cauliflower. It's uh, I think it's called Romanesco, and I just uh, yeah. got it for the shape. And now 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 I need to prepare now I need to prepare it before it becomes rotten. But that's <laughs> been sitting in my refrigerator for a while just because of the geometry, which I found interesting. Yes, uh, I think it is um, a Romanesco. Yes, uh, the geometry is interesting, but just the regular cauliflower. You know how it expands. And um, that, that's an example of hyperbolic geometry. And if it expands more, it kind of curves more. That's one of the ideas. So if you think that you're learning, uh, if you're thinking that you're learning some part of a space and it becomes more important to you, then there will be more concepts in that space and the curvature of that space will grow. So. Even though all of the analysis that we have done here are with uniform curvature, but um, the reality is, is, is more non-uniform than this. So, and um, thank you for Krista for the demonstration. It becomes a, a true chalk talk. <laughs> um, so then, you know, if you evaluate distances between two nodes that are leaves, you have to go back inside the tree. So that's the distance along the tree. And it turns out that this kind of a mapping is exactly what is in the Poincaré half plane. So this hyperbolic space is expands exponentially, consistent with the tree-like structure. So it is hard to fit it into a flat plane. So there are multiple visualizations one of them is a Poincaré half plane, and it's exactly like the, the, the regions become smaller and smaller as you go down. And in that space, the, the geodesic looks approximately like this. It's a circle that goes inside the tree and comes down. So that's one, um, one way that if you have a tree like, um, I should use this for um, 
if you have a tree like structure, then and I want to put it on a map and it's going to be an approximate map, then I would like um, to evaluate distances with the hyperbolic network. And in this way, I will be kind of more true to the underlying uh, structure. And then, so this is a kind of a, so this is a data analysis uh, motivation. And for that reason, there is a, a series of uh, an exponentially expanding number of papers in NIPS community and machine learning community. And they're interested in hyperbolic networks including neural networks because they can fit a lot of things um, and because of their exponential number of states. But I think there's also a biological reason to it or a biological and physical. And um, so the reason is uh, networks that have hidden hyperbolic geometry allow for efficient routing of information. And this is there's a series of papers uh, by Kluka um, he was here at UCSD. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe some people also know, know him, but unfortunately, I started reading his papers when he left UCSD. Uh, so he has a series of papers. One of them, um, very, very interesting, um, called Sustaining the Internet with Hyperbolic Mapping. And they make a point that they say that actually there are like black holes in the internet. Meaning there are nodes, but to reach you cannot reach reach them reliably. The signals just uh, fail to, to to reach them. And so, what they this is an article a few years back, maybe ten years back. And they say, well, in order to sustain the the growth of the internet and make it uh, maintaining its cohesiveness, in order to communicate. In principle, in the network, one has to have full connectivity, knowledge of who is connected to whom. But if um, you map the nodes into a hyperbolic map and we show that it is a good fit, then I can, for a network that has a hidden hyperbolic structure, I can navigate using only local information. So if I know my hyperbolic coordinates, I know my target hyperbolic coordinates. And then um, I also know coordinates of my nodes. Then I just send to the signal to the node that is kind of along the shortest path to the target node. And I don't need to know full connectivity information in the, in the network. Any questions? So the reason I think it's important for biology is because nodes go up and down and uh, connections get reformed and no single node knows full connectivity structure. And um, they can sustain, they can achieve good um, hyperbolic, uh, good routing of information. So those are the two reasons. Any questions from Susan? Are you going to define hyperbolic geometry? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I think it's been defined before me. Um, right, right. Suppose I don't know. So suppose you don't know. Uh, so there are different models. Um, so the hyperbolic geometry is um, um, so we we have our flat Euclidean geometry has a zero curvature. And then hyperbolic geometry has a negative curvature. So one example is here. This is an example of the hyperbolic surface. Paraboloid, it has a negative curvature because one curvature has the opposite sign of the other one. And you can see that it is qualitatively uh, approximates a tree. But we will be mostly using um, this uh, either this model and here the the technical metric for this part here would be if this is x coordinate along um, here x is here and z um, on the y axis then the distance between two points that have x value and z value 
from being dx squared plus cd squared divided by d squared. So small d that is same here and here, so zero is unattainable because the distance diverges. And um, so if I could have the chalk, I would um, maybe I'll add here. So the distance is so that's the mathematical definition. So that would be a model for this one Kareha thing. But there are other other models. So this is um here in the one also one correct semicircle. So no, not semicircle, just a regular concrete wall. And infinity is here. So you take a plane and you use a tangent function um, to compress within a radius of minus one to plus one. And then it turns out that the geodesic here looks like this, which mimics the kind of um, the geodesic that you would compute along the So does it make sense to talk about fractal geometries in the same framework? And yes, so we will have to answer um, this question too. So let's, well, can you repeat your question? Is, is there, does it make, for, does, it, does it make sense to talk about the fractal dimension of this, uh, of these hyperbolic geometries? I would be interested in this. So I have not, we have not considered fractal geometry, but some people ask about it. So just like I would say, in the Euclidean space, you can have fractal geometry. So, in in some of this work, the dimension is somewhere between two and three, um, and potentially could be fractal if we have enough data to to model this. But I don't think we have done it, so it's a potential future direction. So now to answer Krista's question, I think we had a question on Zoom. So in this case, remember, um, again, maybe I should not have deleted it. So it says divided by d squared. And this model is equivalent to having dx squared plus dy squared minus dt squared. And then um, with the constraint that x squared plus maybe y squared minus t squared is equal to a constant. In other words, so as you look at this hyperboloid here, it is a two-dimensional surface in a three-dimensional space. So it is then it's in three dimensions you get a minus sign, but um, with a constraint. So um, this is it. Did I answer your question, Christoph? Well, I think so. Now the minus t square. Now, now I'm now I'm back to to electrodynamic the vector curve, which is what I'm doing here. So now it kind of sounds like a familiar hyperbolic geometry. Okay. Well, it should be the same one. Okay. So thank you for your question. Okay. So this is the this was a motivation, and. Um, now, things, a lot of things are hierarchical, and um, so now the plan. Oh, sorry, so the plan is I'm presenting evidence for hyperbolic geometry in volatile plant metabolites, as in nature of factory signal. Then we switch to neural responses in the hippocampus and the presentation of space. And then 
if there is interest and sufficient time, uh, or I, will, I can condense the third part about hyperbolic geometry and gene expression. So natural factions similar. Here is the second introduction by um, asking why our faction is difficult. So I have been always interested in this interplay between natural scenes and neural responses, natural visual scenes, natural auditory scenes, and also fashion. But vision is defined and has been studied extensively, and auditory natural signals also very defined and also extensively studied. So what about our faction? So our faction is interesting and also difficult is because um, there be, you have molecules which are discrete, and how do you define distances between molecules? So one approach is to talk about, like they're called physical chemical descriptors, and there are companies that, the databases for sale that um, will characterize a molecule in terms of thousands of these descriptors, and it turns out that the more descriptors you take into account, the, the better it is and um, the prediction, but the, um, the model is still not clear. And then there is this fascinating review by Sal. He worked for many years in the perfume industry, this review here. So I'm taking figures from this review. And he said that our functions cannot be solved or it's not going to be solved anytime soon. Not that we are going to solve it, but I think this part that will answer his question. So he says he's in the perfume industry and he says, well, look at these two molecules. They're identical except for chirality, for orientation of the molecule. One of them smells like experiment here, and the other one smells like caramel. So how, uh, you know, what can we do here? And then, um, and then he, in his papers, he has his, a series of triplets. And I'm just showing you one triplet here. You have two molecules that are very similar chemically and smell very differently. One is cumin, the other one is almond. And then there is a third molecule that smells like almond but has a completely different structure. So my interpretation and kind of the message that I want to um, arrive today is that the reason these things mm -hmm. Um, smell similar and, and different from these ones is because they're part of the same pathway. And so even though they're chemically very different, if they are co-produced in the pathway, that's what's important from the perception. So his point here that a function cannot be solved is not about chemistry. It's about understanding the transformations that take place within the olfactory system that make these two molecules smell the same and these two um, different. Are there any chemists in the audience? No chemists? So um, I was told that this is a hydrogen cyanide, which is a poison here on the right. Here. And, um, and you know, nobody can really store it, neither a plant nor a human. And it's a poison, but it is co produced in slight way. And also, uh, I was told some forensic scientists. So, if, if somebody is poisoned um, by this uh, hydrogen cyanide, the body will smell like almond. That's a fun fact. <laughs> you might not want to know. But, um, so, the idea is that the molecules that are co produced will be um, perceived similarly because they represent the same phenomenon that is occurring in the plant or in the environment. So that's how we will evaluate distances between molecules, not by their chemical structure, but by how they co-occur um, in the environment, so basically correlation distances. So um, the data set was uh, the data set of strawberries they're interested in making a perfect strawberry for us. So some of you might notice that in an industrial strawberry, it lost its smell. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you, you know, it's a metabolically costly, and why should you make efforts to be to smell nice when it is going to be picked up and eaten no matter how it smells, it's, a, it's right there. So, but nevertheless, the food industry is interested in um, improving their um, behavior. And so they studied, so this is the publicly available data set here. And they studied different genetic varieties of strawberries and evaluate what the molecules that they um, produce. And consistent with the view of differences between molecules or between nodes or neurons, so people can use a correlation distance between molecules. And if they're closer, meaning they fluctuate together, then they will be assigned smaller distance. Any questions about this? How we measure distances between points? First, what exactly do the numbers mean here? I assume the rows are different. Strawberries. Different genetic varieties of strawberries, yes. And then each uh, sample is put into gas chromatography, and then the concentration. So this is a concentration, could be the area under the peak. Um, it's a zero metric, or is it better than Schwitterman's metric? Uh, the metric is mine, the data is Schwitterman. The number means the prevalence. Mm -hmm. Some way. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So now we have, um, um, say, 80 molecules, and we have distances between them. And it's like a mesh. You're going to be trying it out on different surfaces. So one surface we are all familiar with is the spherical geometry. And if I start measuring distances between cities, if they are within one region, then it will be, I cannot rule out the flat hypothesis. But if they are from different parts of the world, then it will not be consistent with the flat Earth hypothesis. So now we take our data um, and we have a distance matrix between points in which case molecules. And so this is just a summary of a small um, segment of the data. And we will be generating similar matrices from by putting a similar number of points in different surfaces, either Euclidean, hyperbolic, and um, um, vertical, which are these three options. Now, the goal is to compare this matrix, which is from data, and this matrix, which is from model. And we have a lot of choices for methods. I have used here a topological method, but we later on in the talk, we will be using analogs of just multidimensional scale. So in this case, this is a method um, other people have done it too, but we used and took the code from um, Vladimir Itzfalk lab here, which is Karina Kurta. So you take a matrix, you threshold it at the sum level, and if the correlation between points is stronger than the threshold value, you draw an edge. If it is weaker, there is no edge. And then you measure how many cycles are there. So initially, when the threshold is very, very high, only one, two nodes are connected. And there's no cycle because they're not connected. And then at the end, when everybody's connected, again, there are no cycles because for this to be a cycle, it has to be connected, but not fully connected. It has to have a missing link three to six and or five to one. So, in general, when you vary the threshold, and then the reason it is a non metric method is that when you, you're going to vary the threshold from what you consider to be connected, you will get these topological characteristics of this data matrix called Betty curves, and they, they, they can be of different orders. It's just the number of connected components, um, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. Yes. We're already confused. So if everybody's connected to everybody else, then you can tessellate it. Yes. So you can go from A to B to C back to A. 
Why is that not a cycle? Well, I think basically because this is kind of can be contracted and topologically it's not a cycle. If it, if it can be fully contracted, they don't call it a cycle. Only when it has this kind of a singularity within, and then um so that's that's their definition. So this uh, this the BG2 is uh, yeah. So can, can this topological method distinguish hyperbolic or flat geometry? Because it looks like hyperbolic is a geometric property, which might yes. So what happens is that you, you these beta curves they are like a signature of um, how distances are distributed, the properties of the distance matrix. And um, so what Vladimir Scott did in his paper here. He showed that one can distinguish um, a data distance matrix that is random. So this is the random matrix will generate this beta curve. But if you have Euclidean um, things, then you will generate this beta curve. And they're different because uh, they peak in different places. And they, these beta curves, like higher order, becomes higher peak. And this one smaller peak. So this is kind of a diagnostic tool. And then we tried it with hyperbolic geometry. And we found that you can distinguish hyperbolic geometry and Euclidean geometry. So this is just a tool for um, picking out the, you know somewhat subtle differences in the in the in the matrix you know, between model. And data, but you don't have to use it. You can also use multi-dimensional scaling with hyperbolic. Any questions from Zoom? No. Yeah, I, I still have a question. Suppose this hyperbolic geometry, suppose the space is not uniform, doesn't have uniform curvature. Yes. The hyperbolic space, whether this beta curve will work or, or not. What's well, this so the, the beta curve will work, but it might not match the data. Oh. So turns out that um, if you have, for example, non uniform distribution of points, then the beta curve could have multiple peaks. Um, if you're um, you know, then we even relatively subtle differences is like, for example, in the multi dimensional spaces, like in a two dimensional space, like on a circle, if you uh, position points uniformly in angles, it's also the same thing as uniformly along the circle. But in three and higher dimensions, if you position signals uniformly in angles, they will be kind of non-uniform on the sphere and the beta curves will be different. So sometimes they don't they don't match. And they are they are somewhat stubborn. So there are limits to you know what, what we will be doing is we will be changing dimensionality of the model and the curvature. And also sometimes we have to take into account noise. This is meaning that this is data, and of course, we, we measure the variability in the correlation function. So we know how variable are these distances. And on the other hand, in the model, you might want to add noise of comparable magnitude. And sometimes that's, that's important too. So you will have these, say, three parameters, amount of noise, amount of curvature of the space, and dimensionality. And the beta curves will not take arbitrary shapes, so that they will be constrained. They either match it or they don't match. Any more questions? Is the shape of these uh, of these curves going to depend on? Well, so I mean, they are sensitive to differences in the distribution um, and dimensionality and curvature. We have done only numerical empirical investigation, but 
there are people who are more, well, especially more in the psychological condition now. So this is a, the first result. So we take this story data set and we compare with uh, three possible geometries of constant curvature, um, positive um, here, positive, uh, zero, and negative. And we found that um, only the hyperbolic geometry match. So what is plotted here in black triangle is the integral of this Betty curve. So this is one of the signatures. And you can tell that um, you can easily allow spherical geometry or Euclidean geometry, and it can be consistent with hyperbolic geometry. So it's like the, in this way, they're a little bit separated. You are separating nonlinear dimensionality reduction in the two parts. One is what is the rough properties of the surface that can fit the data? And the second step is once we know geometry and dimensionality, the actual position of points. Why do you think the um, the spherical um, traits and the uh, Euclidean traits are different? Mm -hmm. I think they're different. I think they're different. So I was a little worried that maybe I copied the same figure, but no. This one um, had the, the air bar and this one the air bar overlap. So yeah. maybe they're different. Okay. So, um, oh, okay. I mean, maybe the, you know, the, the differences are so, so this is in two dimensions, um, like that. Like, you know, literally the sphere, and um, so I'm looking at the three dimensions here. So then it turns out that um, Yan Chengzhou, who did this work, is has since graduated from the quantitative biology specialization at the USD. So when initially I told him about this strawberry data set, he came back with very active uh, students who said, well, there are more data sets online. How about mouse urine? So that's one of our favorite data sets in terms of how it fits the hyperbolic geometry. So what is shown in there is blueberry data set. So different varieties of blueberries, different varieties of tomatoes. And in all cases, three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry with approximately the same kind of a curvature level uh, fits um, the data, which in retrospect we interpret that they just have this similar hierarchical structure, similar complexity. And uh, here we have Euclidean geometry, and one can rule it out um, in all data sets, including the ones that look like the air bar might overlap, but it's still statistically significant. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so what, what parameter do you have uh, when fitting this data for the hyperbolic one? So um, dimensionality, mm -hmm. curvature, and um, a little bit the amount of noise. And in this particular case, so the way um, it turns out to fit the data best, was to constrain the data to be a shell. So it's non uniform distribution of cross radius. It, it, it has, you know, in order to get the Betty curves to fit. So there is another parameter, the depth of the shell. Are there other Betty numbers? Yes. They go to infinity. Um, but um, the problem is that they take more and more CPU time to compute, and they also require more and more data because the higher the data curve, the more data you need, and then they become more less reliable. So you can see the evidence of this here that the error bars grow. So the the data is in the black 
and then different templates of the model are have larger error bars. So in practice, the third order I would say is sufficient to is that going to work? Well, it's not going to work. So how did you uh, measure the distance in theta? So so, so the yeah. correlation yeah. difference is here. Yeah. Um. So you have a few choices, but we use a correlation distance between points. So if you use uh, another measure to evaluate the correlation of the other thing, the result can change. Can change. Um. So we tried um a few distances and like correlation or correlation between logarithm of the data and that was stable but how to select the distance is um uh, an art of this thing yeah the results will change um krista so it's abundance of yeah, so uh, how TFT? We will discuss the tastiness of the molecule. Um, so now uh, this is actually kind of the, the next um, the next part is to visualize the position of these points. So from 2D, we go to 3D. And um, now instead of a one career circle, uh, you have a one career ball. And uh, then each molecule is um, taken from the natural set, data set, and the position, the distance between them is how often, how correlated they are. And to, to, so these are just um, to illustrate the bigger molecules. They took some random molecules from this to show you. And then this is the distance between them to show that this is not a circular space. And you can see that these molecules are all on the surface. And I think we think that's because it is, they're all kind of children because they're volatile. They do not make, they're the end product of reactions. Now, can you repeat your question? I, I think I was not answering about, no, the tasty molecule question. Okay. So now um, answering this, the, the tastiness of the molecules. So in this case, we, we have now more molecules. We combine the data set between strawberry and tomato. And what is shown here is the position of points based on their co-occurrence in the natural world. And now the color is what can be an analog of taste, but it's the human rating how much they like the overall sample. And what is interesting to me here is that even though the data points are exclusively about the natural world, the human perception is continuous or typographic. There is a clear region here where people say, well, that's, a, that's kind of a good region. So what I'm hoping to drive to this with this result is to say, just like we have three-dimensional color space, I can go to a store and say, I need this color. Here's the RGB values, and they will mix me a color exactly. Same thing for orderings. So we think, um, you know, based on this data set, maybe. So suppose it is three dimensional, like it is here, and I will say my preferred wine has these, these coordinates 2.7, 3.5, so make it more. Quantitative, as opposed to right now, when you read the label on food or on wine, it says it's a fruity flavor with a tinge of oak and remind you of summer. Um, so that's the the result. How the, did I answer your tastiness question? So the preferred um, molecule here is um, the, the red axis is the correlation with. Uh, the pleasantness. And then there are other parts you can talk about, and maybe we can skip um, 
in terms of but you can define other axes in this space because this space is so dimensional you can predict how something will be pleasant based on the boiling point or acidity of the sample yes yeah. so this is for individual molecules right the, each dot is an individual molecule right so obviously wine consists of a lot of molecules yes yeah. how would you yes so the pleasantness is um um, is a property of a sample. Um, so the some yeah, so that's right. So the the implication or the way I think about this data is that these molecules here, they are placed because they indicate that there is some pathway that is activated that we find useful and pleasant. And it doesn't matter to me exact position or exact concentration of individual order molecules. I just need them to have to be a mixture. Um, and then you can substitute. And there is some factor research which says that you can substitute molecules and that's okay in the mixture. But it also, I think, generates a lot of predictions to be tested. Uh, if this is a hyperbolic map, then we, we can make predictions for how vectors are to be added and so how the mixture will be perceived based on the constituents of, um, um, of the points in the mixture. And there are also papers talking about the so-called olfactory white, meaning you put so many molecules into the mixture that it kind of loses its smell. And in this case, the, the hypothesis would be that you um you would take um points um let's see do we have I want to recover my mouse here yeah. oh there we have two two there's two ones yeah one is moving and the other one is not moving one sort of to your back there what I'm moving I see yeah, so suppose if you start adding vectors that represent different parts of the space, then the average will go to zero. And that's my hypothesis of what is an olfactory one. And I think there's data from, say, now Sabel's lab and Weizmann Institute where they talk about this olfactory one. A friend of mine uh, who works in France in the Centre de Gou of uh, at the University of Burgundy was trained in face recognition. And you know that uh, that kind of average face is very attractive. So she did this experiment where she took two lines, four lines, eight lines, 16 lines, and mixed them together and up to eight. They got better and better, and then 16 went down, so maybe that's the zero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the white. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I would imagine that it's also may have something to do with um, kind of the curvature of the space and how many hyperbolic vectors I can add before, and, and at some point, there won't be any difference. So that's to, to be explored. So now a little bit about neurons. Um, the, the clock is shows ten o'clock. So um, we're going. So we have neurons. So I think we have twenty minutes for neurons. And um, what I, I will give you the conclusion that I hope to impart in this section is that what we studied was natural scenes, and I think this is general, but. Um, we are working on neural responses in the olfactory system, but not. Um, but I have data now from space representation. This is the work by Hong Chiu Zhang. And the new part here is that one could address learning and how neural representations grow with experience. And it turns out that um, one could think of this as the a tree that is growing, as you know, in the Shannon mutual information derivation, 
mutual information is derived based on a tree. Um, and what we find is that with time, you can estimate how much information you can obtain from a kind of a discrete one sunlight process. And the growth of the neural representation matches that um, curve, the logarithmic curve. So we see that the representation is hyperbolic, it expands, and the expansion matches the information that um, one could possibly have acquired. Let's check what we have. Questions we have. I see. So far, uh, people ask, I see a spherical geometry, not a hyperbolic one. Yeah, so this is an important comment. And um, not um, it, it, it can be confusing here. So the reason is that we can blame Von Carré. Um, so this is a Von Carré ball. So you take space and you compress it towards a finite volume. Or if you have a unit curvature, and um, it, it kind of has it. So the reason um, to show that this is not a true sphere is um, by this geodesic here. So I have drawn a geodesic, and the geodesic goes inside and is attracted to the center. So the reason it is a sphere is to think of it as an envelope of a tree that is not visible. So think of it that these are molecules that are flying away, and I don't I don't have information about the network of metabolites that are solid and not volatile. And we are trying to infer average branching ratios of that tree by what a are its signatures. So even though they are, we use spheres to visualize the data, they are, they are hyperbolic spheres where the, in order to get from one point to another, you don't go along the sphere, you go inside of it. Okay. This is a bit more like the thing on the left. Yes, so like if you want to say, Suppose, you know, imagine this tree on the left is breathing or pulsating, and you're measuring um, the correlation between one branch and another branch in order to determine um, kind of what is the hidden driving factors behind it. You have to go inside the tree and then kind of to the last common ancestor and then back out. Okay. Do you, do you think all perceptual spaces are um, hyperbolic in this way, or? I think they're hyperbolic in different ways. So my interest in these hyperbolic um, spaces began in visual perception. There's a work by, there's a, one, a very interesting book, Mathematical Theory of Binocular Vision by, I forget his name, Blumen, no. Um, I forgot the name. He worked, uh, he was funded by Naval Research, and um, he measured the um, human visual perception. If you're sitting straight and you're not moving your eyes, then you can see hyperbolic effects on the scale of a few meters. And he talked about building the so called equal distance alley, 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 like yeah. street, alley and parallel elements. So if my perception is Euclidean, then if you ask me to align a set of lights, um, to make them, to make a line, two lines parallel to each other, or make the distance between two points equal to each other, then the lines should line up. But if the perception is hyperbolic, then one of the alleys will be on the outside. And it exactly corresponds with hyperbolic geometry. And using this, one could even measure for a given person what's your hyperbolic radius and what's the other person's hyperbolic radius. And it's supposed to correspond to acuity. So visual perception is like a dose. And in fact, he cites how children 
maybe try to grab the moon because the moon is actually much closer visually to us than the real physical distance because of this compression of from distances. So that's from or what lies the moon at the sun, do you remember? Or um or about the moon being seen closer. I don't know. Yeah. I mean I think it is closer, though. No? Yeah. <laughs> about the same size. Okay. So um, so then, you know, and then there are other follow-up papers. Um, there's like, um, uh, there are books about it in like hyperbolic um, haptic space, hyperbolic color space. Um, what else? I think uh, I, I don't remember about auditory space. Um, let's see. So now neural representation. So I think. Most of you know that this is just a refresher that we will be talking about clay cells in the CA1 region. And as red is running around, it, my neuron has a preferred place where it fires. And actually, this neuron can have multiple clay fields, so they, they don't have to be continuous, but that's, um, and that's okay because the analysis will not be placed based on place fields. But the intuition can be based on place fields. And then it turns out, I'm not sure if I um, have this figure, but um, there are some historical analysis which show that the way um, that Charles Darwin knew of this mathematical trick, which is shown here, here, um, Prior to him, so people wanted to classify species, and they were playing games in far west of Europe of how to classify species based on this set of overlapping um, molecules. And I even have a slide, I think. I may have taken it out. Mm -hmm. Here. So this is um, a graph from this paper. The, characterization of species. And the, the homo sapiens here in the middle and so on. And apparently, so in this paper here from which I took this, um, well, this is the review that decides this one, but they say that um, there be new of this construction. So if you have a circle, you leave the position as is, but you lift and uh, assign the z coordinate that is proportional with some function of its radius. So a big circle, big category, will be like a root node. And from there, apparently, he constructed this um, tree of life. So that's, uh, I think that's sometimes a fun fact to know. So now thinking about place fields, uh, imagine these neurons. So if one uh, place field is completely within another, then you draw a link. And if they are partially overlapping, then the neurons. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's like <laughs> the end of the talk. Is that... Yes, I think I had some more audio attacks of them than I had anticipated. Anyway, so but one of the signatures is that the place field size should be exponential. And um, this is the data that um, was shared with us by Albert Lee from Genelia. They were interested in large um, representation of large spaces. And this is a picture of their experiment where the rat is running along a very long track. And um, it's kind of also curvy, which will be important. And, uh, and and then, um, so now I'm rolling this track, position on the linear track, and this is um, different place fields here. And if you plot the distribution, it is exponential. So it is potentially consistent with the hyperbolic tree-like organization. Any questions about place fields? Yeah. But we will not be using place fields uh, analysis too much because uh, of this issue that neurons can have multiple places. 
And then it's not clear how to, for a neuron that has multiple plate fields, how to make it into a network, but you can still compute correlation between activities of the neuron, put it into um, this basic curve analysis. And here's um, the result where um, this is data from this linear track. The experimental Betty curve is. Um, um, experimental Betty curve is um, here in dash line, and in solid is the average of model Betty curves, and the dash um, shading is the air bar. And you can see the, that hyperbolic geometry is consistent. We had to add some noise to it, but it's also three dimensional and um, higher curvature than in the strawberry data. And then if we can jump to one can roll out, and also if you shuffle the data, then um, it will be more consistent with the random very curve. So there's other data sets online. So Poncho um, took data from Buzakis lab. This is in a square box. And in this case, also a three-dimensional Betty curves are consistent with the data. And the Euclidean ones are not consistent. Okay, so now the interesting part is the extension of the space. So in the case of the Buzakis um, data, they would bring the animal back on multiple days. And then point show did analysis and found that the curvature was somewhat larger upon subsequent exposures. And then you know they say every theorist should have a logarithm in their presentation. So here it is. So it turns out that uh, you can do it with a logarithm. And uh, but a lot of things can be fit with a logarithm, but in this particular case, there is actually a theoretical justification. So if you look for information that can be acquired in a Poisson process. Um, in kind of times of delta t, then this information it goes as for example as log one plus t over some normalizing constant, and then there are some corrections. So in the limit of large t, this goes away, and this goes away. Um, t over t goes away. Um, and then we are left with this dominant term of log one plus t. And that's actually the fit here. And what is interesting here is that this time t naught, I think, can be interpreted as a difference between when the environment is novel and when it is familiar. So in the novel regime, you have this rapid extension, and then and then you have a logarithmic extension. So what is interesting is what I'm plotting on this axis is the radius of the hyperbolic map or equivalent to the curvature. So how big is this map? And it turns out this map is growing in the um, same amount or matching the, uh, the entropy of the Poisson process. Of course, we cannot measure exactly how much information the animal receives. But I think for future research, maybe with humans or other, you know, did they pay attention? <laughs> maybe the space extends more. Um, but for now, it is a primarily time. So I think I will um, um, start um, concluding. And um, I shared with you main results. I will only sh um, tell you. Um, a few short sentences, statements that the growth of this space is actually observed on very small time intervals. So when the animal runs a little bit faster or a little bit slower, so when it runs slower, the neural representation extends more. So like they say, take your time in learning something because all of these synaptic plasticity mechanisms they need time. Um, and that's what, what we are finding here. So there are segments of the track that are curvier, and the animal is um, runs slower, and so the field size is bigger 
when they run faster. So they have a coarser representation. And uh, that's the same thing, but now on a smaller time scale, that the when you look at the neural representation, it has a slightly bigger radius or when the speed is smaller or familiarity is smaller. And then the, I would say I will skip many things, but a few things, but the most interesting part is well, one of the interesting parts is this one is that when you did a simulation, you put snake fields and um, with different kind of geometry, suppose hyperbolic geometry, and now with different radius, but for a given number of nodes. And it turns out that when you only have 50 nodes, then you shouldn't have a very detailed network because there will be a lot of holes in it. And then as you have more and more neurons, uh, the optimal radius or the size of the network grows. So this is 50,000 versus 50. So the optimal hyperbolic radius increases. And then the match is that these are simulations and this is the data and it lies on the same curve. So the data point is obtained by taking the number of neurons in the CA1 region and the curvature is the curvature that we extract by fitting the data. So it suggests that the number of neurons in the C1 and the curvature of their representation is matched to um, make some what the accuracy. So that's the um, summary of the neural part that with experience, the neural representation become more detailed. They remain to be hyperbolic, but now have finer detail. And the size of this hyperbolic map is optimized by the number of neurons and it increases with experience. Now I'll just show you, I'm going to skip uh, all these um, gene expression things because it's the end of one certain yeah. um, And um, I will just um, sum up here that I focused uh, on in talking you today about natural orders from plants and animals here, this part. We discussed neural representations, and the parts that I skipped was human perception. So perception of bodies would be here, and um, actually gene expression. And we have some methods based on TSNI and um, MVS that uh, take into account hyperbolic geometry, and in doing so, they achieve um, improved visualization. So now here is a hello from my group. The work on natural orders was done by Yuan Shen and um, the point show here uh, did the work on neural responses. So thank you for your attention. So thinking about the use of hyperbolic geometry, so you anything about adaptation of that? Say again. Uh, just, so uh, this this so I know you've done more in adaptation, and I was wondering if so does the hyperbolic geometry have adaptation kind of baked into it, or is it a well, different thing that has some We don't have to put it into it, but I think it will be more like a broccoli that. Uh, I imagine that we all have our olfactory sphere, hyperbolic sphere, but the connoisseur will have a higher density or accuracy in the game. Um, with adaptation, there will be more resources devoted to one part. So, in the example of natural order and the neural responses, do the dimension of the hyperbolic space? The same, or do they have to, to the dimension? Other, sorry, other dimensions of hyperbolic mm -hmm. space the same. So, um, it's three dimensions but different curvature. And in the part that I skip, um, is that I am in the chat here. So there are cases when, and I see that uh, Ha Dong is on Zoom here. He's a student. So there are cases 
Uh, we have never seen a two-dimensional hyperbolic geometry that's not in a um, dimension. But <clears throat> starting from three and higher, it becomes reasonable. I think there might be some mathematical reasons for it. Um, all of these quadratic gestures were proven for three dimensions and higher. And that requires more investment in topological space for me to understand. But <clears throat> here is some data. This is gene expression, and it's done in different cell types. So this is mouse embryo, lung, kidney, brain, <laughs> and human samples of all varieties. And you can see that the um, the size of the hyperbolic map is bigger for more differentiated organs. So we interpret this as saying as a measure of complexity in the data set or hierarchical depths in the data set. So in the case of neural responses, it was around 1320. Um, and then in the case of metabolic data, it was around five or seven. So the curvature is different. Dimensionality is, is about three, and in other data sets um, that are maybe more complex, we do find that the higher dimensional geometry yeah. is there. A rich that question. So you are not expecting that uh, the dimensionality of the hyperbolic space uh, depends on the, the layer space, the dimensionality of layer space environment. No, well, no. So the dimensionality of the real space is how many measurements did I take to characterize that data point? And for example, the exemplified in the genetic gene space, we have 20,000 genes, but do I really have 20,000 independent variables? And most likely, no. So in the case of a plant, well, uh, a plant can do maybe four different things. It can decide to grow. It can defend against pathogens, um, turn on photosynthesis, and like make it more stable. So, and then of course the subdivision within the four major processes. So, like bodies, you know, are a tree like right okay. mm -hmm. Or Zoom, and a lot of objects in computer vision might be described as in, in a tree like fashion. So, is there, um, have people been applying these ideas to computer vision or um, descriptions of biological um, bodies and things like that? Or, you know, yeah, so. Um... Obviously, plants. So I had a figure on the paper from a paper, um, you know, literally the tree of life, and they say, oh, you know, that if you use hyperbolic spaces um, in two or three dimensions, you can put the the tree more efficiently in a two or three dimensions. Then you zoom in, and you know, this will be all the primates. Um, so and then that, of course, based on similarity, but it also goes back to the original idea that. We have all these descriptors, and from the descriptor, you can reconstruct the underlying phylogenetic tree of which the descriptors are derived. Yeah, yeah but that's a different kind of tree than I was trying to do. This tree, you know, and objects in general have, you know, they play a main part and then they branch off. So I'm thinking about. Um, just um, descriptions of objects in your world. Mm, well, the papers that I know, they're, they use it for the like language model. And so, just straightforward computer vision, just the embeddings of images. So, is somebody doing that, embedding images and hyperbolic or? Um, we, we are doing it, but I have the feeling that we also have been done to different to very success by others. So we are doing it in a kind of a for our particular data set where I would like to relate reportiness to 
you know, other properties, either eye movement or something specific. I, I don't have the specific references, but I think um, if people have done it that, you know, we use the hyperbolic networks for this particular data set and we embed with a smaller number of images. Okay, maybe maybe a very maybe a very basic question. Okay, I I'm I'm kind of I kind of got lost in the in the uh, in the uh, in the spaces there. For somebody who's uh, who who actually uh, quit theoretical physics at general relativity, I think that um, okay. First of all, you need to establish some sort of metric, and then you need to establish some sort of coordinate systems. Now, if I want to try and catch up with the prerequisites of what you're doing, where would I start looking? So we impose the, the metric, we start with the metric. And so what, um, you know, what this, um, what this means here, um, like this model data matrix, what it implies is that you specify the dimensionality of the space, the metric, you put points randomly, but according to the density that you would expect for a hyperbolic space, into into that model space and then evaluate distances using the metric and that's the comparison um okay distance distance means distance means distance between points and i may have asked this question before but but what what again are the points in the different in the different applications where your hyperbolic formalism applies to so in, in in one in in one case it was the uh, the molecules and the the frequency of uh, the the distance was the frequent the statistical frequency of them being produced. So if they're if they're if the if if the abundance is correlated, they're close to close to each other. Otherwise, they're far away. It seems, and the points are the molecules. Now in the other situations where you look at that, what are the points and what defines the distance? Okay, so let me let me try um, with annotation. So what you said that was correct about the data and interpretation of this data matrix changes depending on the context. It can be molecules, in other contexts, it can be gene expression, it can be neural responses. And so the points are neurons and the correlation between them are the distances. So in different contexts, this is how this different data matrix is produced. Now we are, we don't know in what space these points to um, kind of position them in. So then it, there comes the hyperbolic space, and this is abstract space, but it has, you know, you, you define the hyperbolic space with the hyper, true hyperbolic metric, and you put the same number of points, which are now in abstract coordinate x, y, z um, space, and you evaluate distances between these abstract points according to the metric of that space, and that gives you this matrix. And then one uses some method to make this matrix equal that matrix. Can anybody replace? Okay, it takes a bit. Yeah, so um, you have some experimental points that generate distance matrix, and you have True geometry that you specified, wrote down, uh, defined abstract axes, put some points in there, and then you're matching the distances between them. And then once you're done matching the distances, um, you can evaluate, and maybe um, if we are fortunate, we can find some axis that kind of makes sense. So if, um, in this case, you could say, well, what are the axes? And you said, well, what are the axes in this abstract space? Well, it seems like you know one axis correlates with how pleasant the molecule is. The other one correlates with boiling. Then in some other work, you know, we would say if we get axis that correlates with ripening of the fruit. And so, so those are. So this is a, this is a coordinate system, and then what then what you're finding is that 
if you're looking at the different coordinate systems that are there, for, for example, those look very much like spherical polar coordinates. So the, the hyperbolic ones seem to be well hidden. But what, you, what you're finding then is that if you're now trying to uh, parameterize this metric space with coordinates, hyperbolic coordinates are, are a favorable choice. Yes, so, you know, technically it is a coordinate system and I, I can use, um, say, coordinates, but, um, you know, this will be X, Y, Z, but um, it, because the goal is to relate this to biology, it says, well, you know, I can choose arbitrary orientation, but let me choose the orientation where um, um, that it corresponds with some biological meaning. So it can be like flatness here and in other apps, like fruit ripening, how much sugar it has. No? Okay. Um, so I, unless there's any other burning questions, we're going to transition into our tea situation. So maybe we'll bring some tea it's available. If not, I can pour it down. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm happy to continue answering questions while we drink tea. 